Local news and analysis, and we'll have a robust live debate. To make sure that you're caught up on all of the biggest issues of the day, we'll bring on experts in their field. I'll ask the questions that you'd like to ask. We're not afraid to tackle discussions from all perspectives, including yours. Don't forget The Briefing with me, Arlene Foster, every Friday at 3 p.m. on GB News. We are GB News right across the nation. You can get us on television, on radio, on digital. We're absolutely everywhere. Amazing. You see, amazing. You remind me of me in the European Parliament. <laughs> but here's the most important bit. We are not part of the mainstream establishment. We think and speak just like you do. We are the people's channel. Magnificent. That's really, really thoughtful. Come and join us on GB News, the people's news channel. A very good morning to you. It's 9.30 and this is The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood. Today we're exploring the choices that the government faces. Are we going to see a cutback in capital investment? Does that mean no new nuclear? No new northern powerhouse rail? But it's not just that. Crime is on the rise. We're exploring what's going on in our capital and beyond. And we're looking a little overseas to what's going on with the United States and their midterm elections next week. All that to come after the headlines. Good morning, it's 9.30. I'm Rhiannon Jones with the latest headlines. The Chancellor is looking at raising capital gains tax to address the £50 billion black hole in public finances. The tax covers the sale of assets such as shares and property. A source close to Jeremy Hunt has confirmed the hikes are being considered, but that no decisions have yet been made. It comes after the Bank of England increased the interest rate to the highest level in 14 years yesterday. Total UK footfall was down 11.8% on October three years ago, according to the latest data from the British Retail Consortium. Rising prices and tightening purse strings, tightening purse strings meant fewer consumers made trips to the shops. October marked the first full month of higher energy bills after the price cap rose, while rail strikes also hampered potential footfall. Meanwhile, businesses are calling out for staff, with research showing job adverts for roles such as childminders and dentists have increased. The Recruitment and Employment Confederation says there were more than 150,000 new job posts in October. There will be no Stormont Assembly election before Christmas, the Northern Ireland Secretary has confirmed. Chris Heaton-Harris had said he'd call another poll after the deadline to restore power sharing passed last week. The law requires an election within 12 weeks of that 28th of October deadline, but he's confirmed it won't happen next month. The devolved government hasn't functioned since February, with the Democratic Unionist Party blocking the formation of the ruling executive in protest against the Northern Ireland Protocol. TV Online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Now it's back to Tom with the briefing. A very good morning to you. My name's Tom Harwood. It's 9.33 and this is The Briefing on GB News on your TV and indeed on your radio. Now, this morning we learned that capital investment planned by the government is all up for review. And what does that mean in plain English? Well, potentially new nuclear power stations, new northern house power powerhouse railways and other areas of infrastructure could be scrapped to save cash. Well, these discussions are taking place ahead of the fiscal statement, the autumn statement, that is now due to take place on the 17th of this month. There are some pretty profound political choices facing government. Let's talk through some of those choices now and the general political lay of the land with Dr Richard Johnson, a senior lecturer in US politics and policy at Queen Mary University of London. And um, thank you for joining me this morning. The first uh, point I think that we have to explore is to what extent is uh, the legacy of Boris Johnson and indeed the brief legacy of Liz Truss now 
being torn up by this new government. Boris Johnson made, made a big play in his final speech to Parliament behind that dispatch box, saying that we need to make those long-term investment decisions, we needed to set aside what he called treasury mindset, and we needed to invest in things like new nuclear. Now it looks like that might well be abandoned. Yeah, I mean, if you think about the last election in a bit of, bit of a larger historical context, the Conservatives only have won a sizable majority once in over 30, 35 years, really. You, know, you have to go back to 1987 with Thatcher. Of course, they won the 92 election and they won in 2015, but they were pretty small majorities. The Johnson achievement was to create a kind of new coalition of Conservative voters to put the Conservatives' tanks on Labour's lawn in the uh, Midlands and North. And that required a different set of policy priorities for the, for the party. We are still in that parliament. I know it doesn't feel like it, but we are still in the parliament that was elected on the 2019 uh, mandate. And really, <laughs> between Truss and, and now Sunak, the Conservative government seems to be um, forgetting the mandate on which it was elected. And governments that forget the mandate that put them in office often risk a backlash from them, those voters when they meet them again at the next general election. December 2019 does feel like a complete world away. It was a time before COVID. It was a time when Brexit was on the uh, forefront of everyone's lips as the predominant issue. I, I wonder to what extent can politicians perhaps be forgiven for thinking that, this, that it wasn't only two and a half years ago, that it was in fact a lot, lot longer ago? Yeah, of course, you know, governments can say that the circumstances change and the manifesto commitments they make have to be seen in the light of those circumstances. But that's about it, adjusting priorities in light of, of those challenges. It's not about adopting a completely different set of priorities. I mean, it seems to me that what Rishi Sunak might be intending to do is to try to bring back more of the kind of David Cameron, George Osborne approach to uh, conservative governance. And the problem with that is that uh, A, it didn't actually achieve a huge majority for the Conservatives in 2015. It didn't win them a majority at all in 2010. And that the group of voters that helped them win that small majority in 2015, uh, voters like in places like in Oxford West, um, which amazingly, you know, once upon a time, not that long ago, had a Conservative MP, um, they're not coming back. So it's, you know, it's because of Brexit and the kind of social changes that have occurred. So I, I, I think it's a flawed strategy to think that, uh, you know, you can kind of go pre-Boris uh, in terms of policy priorities and think that you're going to produce Boris johnson size majorities the next election. And it's interesting looking particularly at the context in which we find ourselves now, the energy crisis in particular, the idea that a nuclear power station might be abandoned as something that is uh, being invested in seems like an incredibly short-termist decision. It reminded me this morning of a clip of uh, Nick Clegg the former leader of the Lib Dems, of course, mm. that became very, very famous on social media not that long ago. Here's what uh, Nick Clegg had to say about nuclear power investment back in 2010. The most optimistic scenarios from the government itself, there's no way they're going to have new nuclear uh, come on stream until about 2021, 2022. So it's just not even an answer. not uh, delivering new nuclear power stations back in 2010 because they wouldn't come on stream until 2021, 2022. Are we at risk of our politicians falling into that same trap now again? Yes, I mean, it's, you know, there are many ills that Nick Clegg inflicted on this country while he was in government. That's clearly uh, one, one of the clangers. Uh, you know, this, this is a government that talks about being pro-growth. Well, you don't have growth without investment and investment can come from the private sector sure but you also need government to play its role in investment and government needs to play its role in investment in the kinds of things that government um, does best which is ensuring that we have the correct kind of energy infrastructure that we have the correct kind of transport infrastructure right and if governments don't do that the private sector is not going to necessarily fill the gap 
and that we as a country will be paying the costs of that in lost growth for years and years to come. It's a much, in my view, it's a much bigger travesty, actually, um, you know, and, and actually much bigger damage to growth than, say, what, whatever the GDP consequences of leaving the European single market were. Right? I think that the, these kinds of things are about how our own internal economy functions. And if we're not putting the, the investment behind that, then we're going to suffer for years to come. So really, really interesting and profound choices that the government has to make in the next, what is it, week and a half now. Let's hope that they uh, take on board some of those arguments, and particularly about crucial, critical national energy infrastructure. You'd think now, uh, of all times, the government wouldn't be abandoning that sort of investment. Well, for now, Richard Johnson, thank you so much for joining us uh, this morning on the briefing. Really interesting stuff there. But um, moving on, it could soon be illegal in the United Kingdom for companies like PayPal to demonetize people or organizations for political reasons. The Conservative MP Sally Ann Hart has presented an amendment to the Financial Services and Markets Bill which would make it illegal for a financial services provider to withhold or withdraw service from a customer if it's related to their freedom of expression. Ultimately, it would protect people's right to free speech. Uh, so let's find out more. I'm delighted to say that Sally Ann Hart, the MP for Hastings and Rye, can join me uh, this morning. Thank you for making the time. Uh, I, I suppose, first of all, some people might say that this, of course, is a, an amendment that protects the freedom of the individual, that people should be able to say things that they want to without uh, consequences in their financial lives. However, there'd be another group of people who say, isn't it the freedom of any company to decide who they should or should not do business with? I don't think it's the freedom of any com com company to be able to make decisions based on political reasons. And I do think that, you know, if you're putting yourself out there as a company that provides a service to demonetize an individual or an organisation because you don't agree with their political views. And that is completely wrong. And that shouldn't be allowed. And there needs to be legislation put in place to make it illegal for service payment companies um, to, to be able to do that. And that's what this amendment is seeking to do. Now, how far would this amendment go? Because there are some examples. For example, I suppose the gold-plated version of, of free speech is, of course, the United States' uh, First Amendment. And that, that, of course, protects the right of people who want to, for example, deny the Holocaust or uh, say some really pretty outrageous things on the, on the left of politics. It would protect the Westboro Baptist Church and the picketing of soldiers' funerals, all of these sorts of things. Is that all the sort of speech that is going to be protected in this sort of amendment? Yeah, and I do think, you know, when you're listening, you know, the people who deny the Holocaust, we might think their views are unacceptable but they are entitled to those views. So this sort of amendment is not left or right. It, is, it will encompass all freedom of speech. And, you know, free speech is free speech, whether we agree with those views or not. We don't have a right not to be offended, but we do have a right to express our opinion, um, our views, our freedom of speech, our opinion. And that's really important uh, that we have that right to do that. Freedom of speech is an internationally recognised um, uh, right, human right. And whether we like those views of other people or not, or we agree with them, is irrelevant. It's the fact that we have that right. That's the most important thing. And, of course, it is always those edge cases that are going to be the most contentious, the, the speech that most people would find most disagreeable, that most right-thinking right people would, would want to create more speech to, to counteract. Uh, and yet yeah. it is going to be those sort of examples that are, that are put up to say that this is not the sort of amendment that has a place in modern Britain. Uh, what's your answer to those who would say uh, companies should be able to shut out people who spread uh, misinformation or, or, or say racist things or all of those other really quite uh, distasteful elements that free speech sadly encompass? But free speech is that. It does encompass unacceptable views. We might think they're unacceptable. There'll be those few extremists that think they are acceptable. And we have, to be, we have to be able to counter that. 
view, those extreme views, with very good argument as well. So this is what enables people to make um, decisions based on um, proper sort of views. I mean, Tom, the, the views you and my, I might have compared to some uh, other people uh, are quite mainstream. I mean, I don't like extreme views, but it doesn't mean that we should stop people expressing those views. Mm. Uh, let's talk about process for a second now. Uh, this amendment, what, what chance in reality does it have of becoming law? What sort of support have you been able to garner behind it? So I think there's quite a lot of support. Um, Miriam Cates, who is uh, MP for Penistone, um, when the PayPal um, exited uh, Toby Young's account, the uh, Free Speech Union, um, we garnered some uh, MPs together and wrote a letter to the then chair of the Treasury Select Committee, Mel Stride, and also to the um, f former, um, uh, to Andrew Griffiths, who's still the, 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 the financial secretary to the Treasury, who's the minister on this bill, uh, to voice our concerns about what PayPal was doing. And there were a, a number of MPs that signed that letter. So this really is the start of a process of really highlighting the issue. So the amendment was tabled. It was debated in the bill yesterday. I didn't push it to a vote because if I pushed it for a vote and it wouldn't get through on the basis that uh, the minister showed support, but he was querying whether it was the right legislation to put it in, whether the financial ombudsman was a better um, uh, recourse to action or whether financial conduct authority itself was uh, able to monitor free speech. There are all these issues that need to be taken into account. If I pushed it to a vote yesterday, it wouldn't have got through and mm. the amendment would be dead. So <coughs> we have highlighted it. It now means that we are at the start of a process to really start looking at this whole issue. And I will obviously take up the minister um, for his offer with a meeting with me and with other organisations and MPs to really look at how we can ensure that companies like PayPal, those payment service providers, cannot demonetarise individuals or organisations because they don't agree with their political views. And that is so important that we do that. It's a fascinating campaign. And Sally Ann Hart, please do come back uh, as, it, as it progresses. We really do want to follow this one very, very closely indeed. Um, but for now, thank you for making the time this morning. Uh, Sally Ann Hart, of, of course, MP for Hastings and Rye, pushing that amendment to the finance bill. Now, the United States of America across the pond is just four days away from holding its midterm elections, with the outcome having a major impact on the remaining two years of Joe Biden's presidency and beyond. Will he be able to pass any legislation at all if the, uh, if the, if the House and indeed the Senate swing Republican. Well, Donald Trump is considering launching a third bid for the White House this month, according to his closest advisers, albeit as long as the midterms go the way that he wants. Earlier this week, Biden said that democracy itself would be on the ballot paper at next week's elections. Well, I'm delighted to be joined now by the Professor of International Politics at the University of Birmingham, David Dunn. And David, uh, I suppose, first of all, what are the polls saying here? Because it seems to be quite tight in terms of whether or not the Senate or indeed the House change hands. Most of the opinion polls are suggesting that the House w will have a Republican majority between 15 and 30. Uh, and most of the polls are also saying that the Senate looks tired and, and it's difficult to call. There's a real problem with the polls, however, in that uh, of the last few elections, they've managed to underrepresent, to undercount uh, conservative Republican voters who tend to be shy of telling the truth. In the highly politicized nature of American politics, um, answering polls has become a political act, and therefore they're much less reliable. But I think actually across the board, we can probably expect there to be a change in the House and possibly in the Senate. And, and of course, that spells gridlock for the prospect of, of Biden's next two years in office. It is so often the case that uh, a party comes in uh, at the time of a uh, presidential election, winning uh, both houses and indeed the executive as well. And then two years later, it seems that the pendulum almost always to a beat swings back. I, I suppose, is this just following the predictable pattern? Is there much more that we can read into this with regard to how Americans see Biden's presidency? 
I think, I mean, that's absolutely right. It's true of Reagan, it's true of Clinton, it's true of Obama, who hadn't talked about his shellacking. It was true of, of Trump in 2018. So there is a cyclical pattern. There are other forces at, at, at work here, uh, of course. Uh, there is the Trump factor. Actually, Trump is, is, is a, has a negative impact uh, on the polls in many respects. So in some ways, I mean, certainly a few months ago, the Democrats, in terms of the polls, were doing much better than you would expect. There's also, of course, the, the cyclical nature of the, the economic cycle which is to the disadvantage this time of the incumbents. And of course, uh, as we see across the, the, whole, the whole world uh, and democratic world, uh, the impact of the, of the pandemic are having an impact and opposition parties are doing well there because the government parties are struggling and are blamed with the economic consequences uh, of the pandemic, which are blamed for them. Uh, in America, 51% of uh, uh, electors say that the economy is the number one thing they're focused on. And of course, uh, after the, the pandemic, yeah, that's in a pretty sorry state across the board. It's interesting noting how close the Senate race seems to be this year because there are some really, really interesting seats up for grabs. I'm thinking particularly of Pennsylvania, where, if I'm not mistaken, the first ever Muslim to be nominated by a major party is actually the Republican Party candidate in this crucial swing seat. Yes, yeah, Dr. Mehmet Oz uh, is a Turkish-born uh, Muslim, uh, but he's also someone who was a TV doctor and, and, and became uh, endorsed by Trump as his favorite because Trump likes personalities because they have a, a high name recognition. Uh, he has been uh, portrayed by uh, the uh, Democratic Party as a carpetbagger uh, because he's from nearby New Jersey rather than from Pennsylvania. And he's up against a candidate uh, who has had a stroke. So it's, it's, it's a... It's, it's a very difficult race to predict. Uh, it's a very colorful election. The same is true in Georgia. The same is uh, true in, um, uh, 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 in uh, Ohio. Uh, the candidates backed by Trump are, are making this election cycle a, mm. a, a fascinating soap opera of the personalities, let alone the issues that are involved. And these are crucial swing states that will make a huge difference to the way in which the Senate uh, falls uh, in, in, uh, when the results come through next week. It would be the most remarkable uh, narrative were it, be, were it to be that the Republican Party regain a majority in the Senate thanks to the first ever elected Muslim senator in the United States of America. That would be a real turn up for the books, I suppose one to watch very, very closely. Um, but for now, David Dunn, thank you so much for talking through the really, really interesting elections that are taking place, of course, on Tuesday next week in the United States. Now, finally today, between January 2017 and September 2022, there were, get this, 11,274 gun crimes recorded in London. 11,274. That's around 1.3 offences per 1,000 people. It's a huge number. However, the number of gun crimes in the capital has actually gone down slightly in that period, with sharp rises and falls in between. The, re the number of recorded knife crimes has also fallen slightly, but London still saw 11,100 crimes between, 11, uh, between April 2021 to March of this year. So why is the crime epidemic in London still so fervent? And do those in power, are those in power doing anything to stop it? Well, Andrew Boff is the deputy chair of the London Assembly, a Conservative member of the London Assembly, has served since 2008 um, and uh, joins me now. And I, I suppose these numbers are, are pretty startling, are pretty stark, and it seems like every week there's another story of a stabbing, of a murder, of a crime. What's going on? Well, I think what you've got to do is take into context the entire six years of Sadiq Khan's uh, reign in London. And remember, Sadiq Khan is the police and crime commissioner for London. He is responsible for the overall level of crime. And in that period, we have actually seen an increase. And yes, mm. you're absolutely right. Crime will rise and fall. And I suppose it fell considerably during COVID when everyone was staying at home. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely it did. And he takes full responsibility for that, of course, <laughs> uh, as being his inspired leadership. But actually, the, the, the underlying story is that crime is getting worse in London. And uh, it's getting worse because we have a mayor who, who plays to the gallery rather than has a sharp focus 
on reducing crime in London mm -hmm. and, and making it feel like London is a safe place mm -hmm. to be. A lot of residents don't feel that it's a safe place to walk uh, at night, mm. um, and, and that's down to him. There's been a lot of criticism, of course, about how the Metropolitan Police has been run. There's been a, a, a recent report this week into the culture of sexism and misogyny in police forces, off the back of what happened, of course, with the Sarah Everard case. But also, we had a, uh, a, a commissioner of the Met Police, who was dismissed, who seemed to not get on well with the mayor. There seemed to be a big amount of tension there. Did that play into how things have been run? Well, it's very strange, of course, the, the decline in some of those headline uh, figures on crime actually were a result of the previous commissioner's work. Mm. So, um, and Sadiq Khan found himself in the peculiar situation of confirming her in office and then six weeks later deciding to sack her. I mean, it's that inconsistent approach. It's been constantly driven by um, his need to make excuses mm. for, for poor performance mm. uh, that, I believe, resulted in that. Not the actual central job, his central job of ensuring that our police force has mm. those professional standards that Londoners would So expect. just finally, how should the mayor be dealing with this situation? What standards should be expected? What needs to change to try and stop this relentless spate of stabbings? He, he certainly needs to abandon his initial uh, commitment, which was to cut, stop and search. And as a result of those cuts in stop and search, we saw a massive increase in crime. He needs to put more trust in the police and he also needs to ensure that there's proper continual assessment of police officers to assure, ensure that those professional standards are, remain within the police force because for every rotten, that, those rotten apples in the police force, who are a very tiny number, I, sh I, I should emphasise, they, the, they were allowed uh, to infect the rest of the police force under his tenure, he needs a sharp focus on professional standards. He needs to start doing his job. Wish he'd been doing it for the past six years. Well, Andrew Boff, thank you so much for talking through those issues. It's something that we will be returning to on this programme, of course, because crime is really sliding up the uh, scale of what is being uh, recognised as a huge, huge issue in this country, and particularly in our big metropolitan areas. Andrew Boff there, London-wide Assembly member uh, on the London Assembly. Well, stay with us here on GB News, where Esther McVeigh and Philip Davies will take you through Friday morning with all you need to know heading into the weekend. Monday on GB News. Join my new show, Bev Turner, today from 10 a.m. There's never been a more interesting but also critical time in British politics. And I can't wait to bring you the biggest stories of the day with the best factual accuracy and also a few of my own opinions thrown in. We'll engage in passionate but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Monday to Thursday on GB News. It's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11pm. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11pm, seven nights a week.